Thank you. Um, it's a it's a honor to be here, and it's a it's a really I mean for someone like me who has sort of been in this uh, project along with along with CGD and many other partners for the last uh, fifteen years. This is a, is, a, is a remarkable moment in a sense. And, and I think it's worth saying, uh, I think that what, just reinforcing to start what Amanda said, which is that there has been enormous progress. So 10 years ago, we, JPL had 70 completed and un ongoing evaluations. Now we have 800. Um, that's as as Amanda said, still a tiny bit of what needs to be done, but if just in terms of of having something to talk about, this it's it's a relatively significant amount, and and with that comes a lot. I think a, a sense in which we are now this, not just JPAL but many of these partners in this agenda now have a place at the table. I think 200 of those 800 evaluations are in partnerships with government, different partnerships. So there are, we, there's, that has, I think, among other things, earned us a place in the, at the table. Uh, these are dates below. Not quite designed for. Uh, um, as you can see there, uh, there's, it's, this is meant to, I think, give, convey the impression that this is, you know, there is a fair amount of it distributed all over the world, though some of it is clustered in countries like Kenya and India seem to have a more than their fair share. Um, it's one, one of the things that is uh, also gratifying is that there has been a fair number of them. Not all of them have changed the world, sadly. Uh, some of them haven't even changed the minds of the people who did the evaluation. So, but there a fair number have, and the ones that have have changed, uh, I think, the world in quite significant ways. There are programs that have been, I think, and this is something we'll talk a lot about today, have been scaled up. Now, this is a difficult word to use. It's not obvious what it means to say. I mean, obviously, you we didn't do a RCT of, of the impact of an RCT. So we did not. So is it the case that the RCT had the effect, or did something else have the effect? Was it just in the air? And it's a question we will never answer. So, But there were the ideas that were um, evaluated and found to work were then fed into the policy di discourse and at the same time the policy changed and this is sort of a, a, a small list of things that that changed so is you know and there they are again um, some of these will be will come back to uh, I think perhaps and 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 I think this, this is this is extremely important I think we in terms of uh, as I said, this is always a difficult number to calculate, but our calculation is that about 300 million people have been covered by these programs. So this is not a small change. This is a, a substantial change and one that has real, potentially real welfare impact on the world. So this, this is something that we, we are very proud of. We and as the entire community, I think, have right to be uh, prou proud of it. Having said that, I would uh, what, what, what I want to uh, talk about today is something else. I want to say that I think part of the way we influence policy is clearly by having uh, an impact evaluation, a result, a result then is presented to the to the people running the program, and that leads to change. But I think there's a is a, a different and potentially more deeper change that I think is happening in, in the process of these, coming out of these eva impact evaluations. And that's, that is uh, the, a process that involves um, more than a single evaluation or not even, a, and more than a single piece of evidence. So it's, it's, it's an accretion of evidence that uh, turns into a much more powerful influence potentially than a single 
single evaluation ever can, because in a sense it allows us to address the question that Amanda raised, which is a question of external validity. So it tells us, it allows us to, and it allows us precisely because in a sense it doesn't tell us that we did it in seven places and six of it wor worked. It tells us something more than that. It tells us it worked in, in seven places. Uh, we did it in seven places and six of it it worked. And we found something out of that that told us why. And we understood a bit more why it works. And we could then line it up with other pieces of evidence which we already had, which might be descriptive, might be from just cross-sectional correlations, and all of that story added up. And when that happens, it's extremely powerful. So I want to give you three examples of that, to, where I think we have fundamentally changed our understanding of how a particular set of, of interventions work, the process through which they operate, it, through the process of doing the evaluations. So let me start with, start, start with, uh, so I think 10 years ago, or a bit more than 10 years ago, there was a, I think, an extensive debate about whether things, as in particular things that we think are good for people, uh, preventive health products and should they be how should they be priced should they should you and I think the, there was a very influential view which said that you want to price things the reason why you want to price things is that prices generate good incentives selection the people who pay pay money for them value them and therefore you should price them and I think this this debate could have continued uh, for and uh, but there were there was I think a, f a few pieces of evidence which came out of our cities, which in a sense were sort of a classic example of why our, our cities are powerful. They, they were, uh, the, what our city allows you to do, not just, I mean, it does allows you to do a, a, a reliable evaluation, but in particular, it allows you to vary things which don't vary environmentally. So in other words, you could imagine you have a con environment where bed nets are priced at a particular price, uh, and our city creates an opportunity for changing that price. And for a small number of people in one place, but still, it, you do, that it creates a way of manipulating the, the intervention, which is sort of controlled and just allows you to ask a question. It's an experiment, first and foremost. And what, what that, those experiments, there was one with deworming, one with uh, insecticide-treated bed nets, one, one with uh, uh, chlorine for cleaning water, and all of them suggested the same pattern, which is that the price seemed to have a huge effect on demand, sort of uh, not necessarily commensurate with what you might have imagined would be sort of a normal price elasticity, you know, things get more expensive. This was, you go from zero to 10 cents and suddenly the de demand just vanishes. And that, that effect was very, um, more very distinctive and in a sense unexpected because the effects were enormous. By the time you got to a half of the market price, demand was entirely gone. So there was a sense in which this created a, at least a uh, strong, uh, strong presumption that maybe something very, we need to think about this problem in a very different way. That somehow the point is that these are products that people, they might think they're valuable, but in the, sh in the moment they think something else is valuable and that's why they don't manage to, to, to buy them. When, when it comes to, when it's priced, they just think, okay, something else, some other need presses on them. And if, if that's the case, then you you clearly, that first thing it did, did was it reinforced the case for uh, maybe subsidizing these goods. But second, what it did was it, it cast the question, well, but that doesn't, does that still mean we should subsidize it? Because it, it could be that if you subsidized it and people were actually not very committed to these goods, then maybe when you subsidize it, they still won't use it. 
So then a second set of RCDs came up, which basically asked that question, which is that they varied the price, and they asked the question, do people who get it at low prices actually buy it? And, and what was striking, and if they, sorry, use it. And what was striking was that, and this was pretty interventionist, you couldn't do it except in our city. Go, people, you had to go at night to people's houses to see if there was, the babies were sleeping under the bed nets. But when you did that, it was clear that the price had nothing to do with it. That it wasn't, made no difference whether the price was high or low, people used it the same. There was about 60% usage rate, but that completely uncorrelated with what price you got it at. So that that what what that was what that meant is that we could then I think in a sense go forward with this agenda of tr trying to have much lower prices for these goods, and I think that has had I think significant impact over the world. You can see the countries where the bed net coverage. This was bed net coverage in uh, in 2000. This is bed net coverage in 2015, and green is 100%. So you, you see, there were, this is, and this is, this is the same fact in a sense for different goods. You can see $15 water filters in Ghana, now the price of those has gone down to about a tenth of what it was. So you can see that the same general point has sort of filtered through many, many different products. I have, uh, let me give you two other examples. Microcredit is another, uh, and this is an example where I think to have policy influence, you don't necessarily need to have to have a good good news. Microcredit was kind of the fla flavor of the year in 2005, so we, we are uh, we are exactly 10 years or so after that. And uh, one of the things that was um, I think very uh, attractive about it was exactly this promise that you know once you give people microcredit, they're going to all kind of find their own ways to becoming rich. We don't have to create jobs for them. And since then, there's been a bunch of RCTs of microcredit. The, there were seven across different countries, and they have a consistent message, which is the one thing microcredit doesn't do is make people rich. It might, actually does many things, including, I think, allows them to buy what they want to buy, which is important, but it doesn't make them rich. That, what's, that was the starting point, in a sense, because the next thing that simultaneously kept coming up was, was that, uh, however, uh, a bunch of interventions which involve giving assets to people so this is the graduation program of BRAC, which is basically a combination of giving people an asset and then some support for a few year, for a few months, and then you track them over years. In Bangladesh, where this picture is from, uh, this, these people were tracked for seven years. Seven years later, later they are 60% richer than the control group. So you give them an asset, you take care of them for a few months, help them, and then you walk away, and they, they are 60% uh, uh, richer. Uh, same evidence in India, and similar evidence in other countries. So this, this, this package seems to work, and similar evidence from a bunch of other interventions, which involve the same kind of order of magnitude, 200 to $400 being given away to, uh, to very poor people, and you see the effect of, on on their incomes a few years later, they're 40 to 50% richer in many cases. So th what that's saying is that it's not that, it, what that now brings us to the point is that it cannot possibly be that the, it's, microcredit doesn't work because people are not productive. It must be, and I think that a lot of other there, ancillary evidence therefore fits with that, that they actually don't want to start a business. That the reason why it doesn't work is not because it, it isn't that they couldn't run a business, but because running a business is not what they want to do. They want to do something else. They want to have a job in particular. And so that, I think that whole conversation change, sort of focuses us on asking a very different kind of question than saying that microcredit works or doesn't work. It takes us to a point where we wouldn't have gone unless we went through this whole combination of interventions. Let me give the last example. I'm almost out of time. Uh, and this is 
on education, this is a place where I think there's l lots of um, lots of our cities on education. Uh, the fact that was driving them was the fact that children are mostly in school now. Ninety-five percent of uh, primary age children in India in school, 50% of them can read at second grade level or above. Uh, so that's a stunning fact in a sense, one that should make us very frightened. And it took us a while to sort of figure out w what was going wrong. Because, I mean, there were many, many hypotheses. I, had the, I heard the Minister of Education in India on primetime TV say that now that girls have toilets, this problem will be fixed. I'm all for toilets for girls, but I suspect he's wrong. Uh, so, uh, so there was a range of opinions. Lots of our cities were also done. I think one, and one of the things that it did was to dispel many of those views. And in the end, we were left with a fairly clear answer. What was the answer? The, what the, the answer was ki kind of at some level obvious because it came out of um, the. One, one observation, which is that you know, if you send a, a high school educated kid to help these children learn how to read, they learn much faster than, um, so there were a bunch of our cities of that kind, of what we call teaching at the right level, which is just, if the child can't read, teach him to read, don't teach him calculus. And that idea, plus a high school educated kid who was trained for three days could generate gains of you know, much bigger than a, the child's progress over a year. So that fact was kind of sticking in our face. And you know, if you put that, and, what, and then, and that gain was not only bigger than what a child could gain in a year, it was bigger than the difference between private schools and public schools. That gain was so big that you start wondering why aren't people just doing it? It's a bit so obvious. And I think the answer had to be, and it took us a while to get there, is that actually people don't want it. The teachers decided, and the parents as well, were pretty much in agreement that they didn't really value every child learning. That the, the teachers and the parents were all convinced that the really important thing to do is to cover the curriculum. And the curriculum was whatever, calculus, and the children couldn't read, so there was a mismatch there, but the teachers kept teaching calculus even though the curriculum is, was, uh, so, even though the children were completely lost. And that process continued. And t if you went to teachers and said, why aren't you doing something different? They'll say, well, I have to cover the curriculum because parents expect us need to cover the curriculum, and the, my boss expects me to cover the curriculum. So I think, the, what that taught us is that you can't solve this problem by simply asserting that the RCTs show that something else will work. So we had to work with, the solution had to be working with school systems to embed the idea that the time has to be set aside for children to catch up. And when that was done, we did two large scale RCTs of that intervention where time was set aside, it absolutely worked. You know, children within, um, uh, you get massive gains within school systems in children's learning. If you can embed it inside the school system, you cannot do it otherwise. And this, this was, uh, what re I think this is an example of exactly what I was trying to emphasize, which is that this was not a single RCT. It was not even necessarily just the sum of RCTs. It was a sum of various pieces of evidence, including asking teachers, why aren't you doing this? All of those added up to this story, but once this, we had the story, it was a very powerful tool because we knew exactly where to go. And I think that general message that you know, once that you need to sort of build a, a narrative, I think is, has two big benefits. One is that it, I think it's right that you have to build the narrative, that without the narrative you can't change opinions, you can't figure out where, what the leverage point is. And the second thing is that it, it's, it's intellectually exciting. So I think one of the, one of the senses in which I think uh, I feel very optimistic today is that if I look at JPAL, it's, we have 150 of I think the brightest and the best who are all affiliates, these are professors at top universities who are all doing our cities, mostly in development economics. These are people who 10 years ago or 15 years ago would be pursuing equally exciting 
agenda from their point of view, but would with very little policy impact. These are now trying to solve real world problems. We have, and the reason they are doing that is that they, they find themselves as building a narrative which is entirely different. And therefore, it's intellectually exciting for them. And so I think we are in a great, we are a great uh, juncture. I think there are many things that need to still be uh, institutionally developed. There are many, uh, many, many of those will come up during the day. But I just want to share my excitement with you and uh, let the program go on. Thank you.